Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think this two service thing is going to work. Two services uh, thing is going to work out a lot more comfortable in here. Good to see everybody. He has risen. Come on. He has risen. Amen. Amen. We do have a a couple of things uh, for you to know. There is um, communion that we're going to be taking today. If you don't have communion, make sure you raise your hands and our ushers will get you one. Also, there are flowers in the back. If you don't mind, by the end of service, uh, if you just go back there, take a flower and put it on the cross uh, for us. Uh, I want that cross to be decorated with flowers by the end of our second service as well. We're so glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for joining us uh, on Easter Sunday and also those who are watching online all over the world. I know one person watching from the UK. So glad you guys are tuning in with us online. Um, but let's pray as we begin our Easter service today. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for all you've given us. Thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for the resurrection that changes history. It is because of the resurrection that we are here, we are celebrating that we are forgiven, that we are reconciled with you, that the future is bright because you're there and you meet us. God, we thank you for forgiving us for all the things that we have done and all the things that we're going to do. Thank you for forgiving of our past, our present, and loving us even into our futures. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died and rose, that today we declare victory. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray, and all the people say, amen. amen. Let's stand. Above all powers, above all kings. Of all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all. Of all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure your worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone. And to whom have the arms of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one of whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, 
and the Lord laid on him the inequities of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led away like a lamb to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause his suffering. Though the Lord will make his life an offering for sin, and he will see his offspring and prolong his days, for the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their inequities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intersections for the transgressors. Amen. He rose from the dead in that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body. They saw the angel sitting there. And they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. It's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior. Let's sing Jesus praises this morning.
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trial. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though confined by fiery results in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not know him, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your soul concerning this salvation the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you search intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told by you, those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even the angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with this precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world what was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believed in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope 
are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable deeds, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Amen.
may be seated. Good morning again. He is risen. He is risen yes. The answer is yes, Rosie. <laughs> So glad you're here. A couple announcements before we begin today. Uh, small groups, anyone can sign up for small groups. There, uh, you can sign up online. You can sign up on the back. You don't have to be a mature Christian or know the Bible ins and out to sign up for small groups. Um, it's for everybody and anybody. Actually, small groups are an opportunity for you uh, to get connected, to ask questions, to go deeper in the Word. Um, it's an opportunity to really ask the hard questions that you might not get to hear from the pulpit. So make sure you sign up for small groups. You can do that online line or uh, in the back at the connection table. Uh, also, Spring Formal is coming up. Uh, what is Spring Formal? It's a way for us to get to know each other, to get to know you, and kind of in a way celebrate our small groups as well. Uh, we're going to have a, a DJ. We're going to dress up. We're going to have food, Italian, bread, garlic bread, uh, meatballs, and Big Z, what do Italians eat? I don't know. They eat, I'm listing a bunch of things that Italians would eat, right? So Italian food, catering, it's going to be really good. So make sure you plan to go to the spring formal from 6.30 to 8.30 on April the 12th. We're going to have sign up online or on the back as well beginning this week just to, so we can gauge how, many, uh, how much food to, to order. Um, if you are, have children, bring your children with you because the kids are going to have something upstairs right behind me. They're going to have their own little, little dance uh, event going on as well. So it'll be fun for all of us just to get together and enjoy each other's company. Also, we have middle school retreat coming up. Uh, it's not too late to sign up, right, Caden? Caden, not too late to sign up. Middle school retreat, middle school madness, April 7, 5, 5th to the 7th, and also Young Adults Retreat as well. It's not too late to sign up for that either. Right, Lewis? Uh, young Adult Retreat is in May 25th and 27th. So we have an array of activities that's going on around here. Make sure you get involved, get to know us as we get to know you. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, there's a card right in front of you. Make sure you fill that out. Leave some kind of information about you. Uh, there's a box on your way in and out. Uh, just drop that in there. That's by way of giving as well. If you came today and, 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 and prepare to give, you can also certainly put that in there. But um, I'm excited about this, this series. Uh, you, you, you see me trying to find my pocket. The reason is because uh, these pants are new. At like 8.45 last night, I was planning my Easter outfit. And I picked out my khaki pants, and I said, wow, it has stained all over it. <laughs> so I asked Liz, I said, what time does Nordstrom Rack close this? She's like, 9 o'clock, you're about 15 minutes. So I jumped in my car, went to Nordstrom Rack. Within five to seven minutes, I got my shoes, my pants, and a shirt, my Easter, Easter outfit, in seven minutes. So I got new shoes, new pants, and new shirts. So I can't find my pocket, usually my, my hand motion and whatnot. But uh, I'm glad you're here. You look, you look fantastic. Your, your, your Easter's best, uh, very colorful. So, um, but, uh, but you know, something it's kind of embarrassing. Um, it's kind of embarrassing if you really think about what happened roughly 2,000 years ago. Uh, the, the guy who claimed to know God, to come from God and walked this earth and performed miracles and convincing everybody that he was from the above, that he is the son of God, and, and him and God are, are one. He's the Christ, the Messiah. Yet, well, it's kind of embarrassing, really, that we don't know the exact date when he was born. We have no records of when Jesus was born. Apparently, the Son of God has no record of his birth. And if you're visiting with me for the first time at church and you listen online, you're like, yeah, that's why I don't go to church. Maybe Easter and Christmas are the only two good days for me. For that very fact. Well, it gets even worse. His earthly father didn't claim him as his own son. Joseph never said, that's my son. We have very little record of him from the age of one to the age of 30. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's it. The son of God is worth 30 pieces of silver. Peter, the one who told Jesus, 
according to historical records, that Jesus, I would never betray you. I would never leave you. I'm with you to the end. Betrayed Jesus three times when he was asked, aren't you one of his disciples? No, I don't know the man. During the crucifixion, everyone deserted him, left. They took a spear and pierced his side to make sure he was dead. His body was dangling there. They took him off the cross and buried him. Here's the most embarrassing fact, actually. After they buried the Son of God, who claims to be the Son of God, and people who hung out with him and saw him, uh, went back to fishing. Back to business as usual. Like nothing ever happened. This is what we're going with? This is why you ran to Nordstrom Rack last night at 8.45 p.m. to pick out an Easter service? This is why you got up and put on your Sunday's best to come and celebrate that? You mean Jesus didn't overthrow Rome? Nope. He didn't. You mean he didn't establish his kingdom and, and everyone live in his kingdom happily ever after? Nope. Didn't do that either. And that's what we're going with. This is the, the, the religion that we started. These are the guys who follow Jesus, listen to his teachings, watch him perform miracles, watch him heal the sick, watch him walk on water, watch him feed 5,000 people with three loaves of bread and two fish, and they, they picked up even the leftovers. Watch him cast out demons. And sometimes Jesus went from place to place without even anyone noticing him. And they went back to fishing. Business as usual. As a matter of fact, John historically recorded that, that Jesus did many other things. If it wasn't... Uh, uh, if it was written down, I suppose, that even the whole world would, have, would not have room for the books that would be written. They can't keep everything that Jesus did. But they went back to fishing. Business as usual. Now, that doesn't sound like a good religion to me. Matter of fact, that sounds like a scam. Uh, that sounds like we've all been tricked, brainwashed, uh, taken advantage of. Made us look like fools to follow this Jesus. But, 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 you know, that doesn't make sense either. Because if that was the embarrassing fact, if, if, that was, if, if Jesus was a fraud, the writers of the Bible wouldn't put those embarrassing facts in there about his followers. If I was to create a religion, I would probably write my followers were... All six, five and above, muscular dudes, bad dudes with swords riding on horses, with capes flapping on their backs and going into every nation that was oppressing people and wipe everybody out. They were victorious. They fought days and night. They didn't even eat. They lived on nothing. They were uh, hunger. Their, 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 their thirsts were, were filled by other people's blood. I would make this story about my religion as if, like, no one can even go up against my men. Amen? That's the kind of religion I would have written. But wait, we, we, we do have that. He died. At 632 A.D., 600 years after Jesus, he started one, and he died. In 632 A.D., 600 years after Jesus, his body was buried there in the Green Dome. The Islam founder, Muhammad, conquered the Eastern Empire, Persia, Ethiopia, and he's buried there in Saudi Arabia. And his body, it's still there today. Before him was Rome. Before the Romans were the Persians. Before the Persians were the Babylonians. Before the Babylonians were the Philistines. Before the Philistines were the Egyptians and so on and so on. And kingdoms rise and falls and they come and they go. And their leader claims to be God. 
Well, well, well Pastor New, what about Buddhism? What, what about the, the Asian people that I grew up and that I was a Buddhist growing up? What, what about them? What happened? Well, that's where Buddha was cremated and stored away. That's his grave. But here's an interesting fact. The Savior of the world, Jesus, here's his tomb. The, the Savior of the world, Jesus, can you pull up his tomb? I know, the, uh, look at my media guy running around. I, I didn't tell them this, right? It's a joke. It doesn't exist. <laughs> They're running around back there. Where, where, where's that slide? The slide's not in here. Where's the slide? <laughs> look at him. I'm watching him. <laughs> I set you up for that one. The tomb of Jesus doesn't exist. Historically recorded, this is what it was written. He is not here. He is risen as he said. He is risen. Amen. He's not here. This very statement has been studied. History has tried to burn this away and bury this and destroy it. They're trying to kill anyone who claimed that. But you can't kill something that is alive and it's a work of God. Amen? We don't have a specific location where Jesus is buried. We have no relics to remember him by. We have an unconfirmed location where he was buried, we think, we don't know for sure. We have an unconfirmed shroud that the historian has been studied over and over and over. This could be the cloth that wrapped Jesus' body. We don't know for sure. Some thinks they have pieces of the thorns that was put on his head. And Indiana Jones still is searching for the Holy Grail. Why? Maybe the reason is because he rose from the dead and he has written, risen. An early Jewish historian, Josephus, this was written in the, in the Jewish antiquities, stored away only 30 years after Jesus resurrected. This is what a Jewish historian wrote about him. Uh, about this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man. If needed, one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surpassing deeds and was a teacher of such people as accepted the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. When upon the accusations of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to the cross, to a cross. Those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand others marvels about him in the tribe of the Christians who called after him has still to this day not disappear. Amen. That is a Jewish historian wrote this down and kept it away the entire Jesus event it's a work of God the, the focus is placed on the resurrection of Jesus because it's just as God has designed it the way we rise with God it's more important than how we die here on earth Jesus did not ask us to remember his birth but he asked us to remember his body and his blood sacrificed for us and rose on the third day for us. Amen? The resurrection changes everything. Judas, who portrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, went and hung himself because of guilt. Peter, who denied him three times, took the message straight to Rome and die for it. Can, can you imagine? <laughs> Just 40 days earlier, you watch Jesus died on the cross at the hands of the Roman soldiers. 40 days later, you went to Rome and you said, this man that you killed, it's Christ and Lord. You're talking about strong men with capes on their backs marching into Rome and say, Jesus, it's Christ 
and Lord, as you just watched them. Why did they do that? Because the resurrection, it's undeniable. Amen? There was a Jewish man, high regards in his circles, a very educated man who initially hated Christians, wrote these words. For I deliver to you as first importance that I also receive that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. This was written 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus by a man who hated Christians. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he had appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. The resurrection of Jesus is undeniable. It changes the course of history. And that's why we celebrate. But what does that have to do with us today? Oh, it's told in this parable. We're going through the parables here at church. Today, we come up to the parable of the prodigal sons. I'm going to explain to you this way. I need two volunteers. volunteer, David, Ben, come up and volunteer for me real quick. All right, I need two guys. Come up, uh, uh, Antonio and Avery, come up. Come up here real quick. I'm going to show. Uh, I want to illustrate this story to you this way. All right, so... This story is written in Luke chapter 15 from the words of Jesus. There's this father. He has, he has two sons, right? Uh, this is David Benton. He's a friend of mine. Um, and this is my son, actually. And this kid could look like he's my son, but he's not because they kind of look alike. Uh, they do. <laughs> they do look alike. But this is my actual son, and he's not my son. But this is my friend, right? But just for the sake of this illustration, let's pretend that they are David's son. So David... Over here, the father, right, which represent God. The father has two sons. One son, this is where a small group is valuable for you because in small group you can ask, who's the older son? Well, that's the nation of Israel. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to focus on the younger son. So he has two sons, the younger son and the older son, right? But here's the ironic part. The younger son said, Father, give me my inheritance now. Now, that was a very disrespectful thing to say to a father because the moment you said that, divide me your inheritance, that means you're saying to your father, you are dead to me. Give me my portion now. But isn't that how we treat God sometimes? God, you, you don't exist to me because this world is mine. I live here. I earn this. I built this. I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. This creation is mine. Father, give me mine. And that's what mine, mine, mine. That's what the younger son did. And the younger son took his father's inheritance. The father didn't even resist. He says, you have free will to do so. Go ahead. I created this world for you anyways. It's yours. The son took the inheritance and went far off. And the more sin he commits, the more uh, lavish living he, he get into, he moved further and further and further or further away from God. What would the, son, the older son do? The, the older son never went after his younger brother. What did the older son do? Oh, look at us. We're so good. I'm the good one. I, go, I come home on time. I, I, I take a shower. I do my own laundry. Do you do own laundry or no? Yeah. You do? Good for you. High five. See, this is the older son that they behave. You know, if you're in small group, you would ask like, is that the nation of Israel? Yeah, because you know how when Jesus came, the, uh, the Jewish people were like, who are those guys? Do they, they get to believe in Jesus too? So this is how the, the, the older son now becoming a little bit uh, self-righteous. Look at, look at that guy. He's sinning. He's falling away from God. I'm with the father still. But let me get you focused on the younger son. The younger son, he, he, he squandered off all of his wealth. As life seems to be impossible now. It seems dark. It seems far away. I'm, I'm so far away from the Father. And he come to his senses uh, when he went to eat with the pigs. Now, for, if you're in small groups, you would ask this question. What is significant about eating with the pigs? As a Jew, pigs are considered unclean. That's how far he's fallen away from God. So he went to eat with the pigs, and he came to his senses, and he says, how many of my father's higher servants has better food than me? 
Let me come home, and I'm going to ask my father, you don't have to put me back in my position. Just let me be with one of your servants. That's good enough for me, Dad. And he began his journey home. But this is the best part about this story. I was reading this, and I ran out of my bedroom. I said, oh, my gosh, Liz, for years I've been reading this story, and I had no idea. Here's the cool part. He began his journey home as he walked from a distant Here's the cool part. He walked him a distance. The father, what did he do? He ran out and hugged his son. Come on. From a distance, he ran out and hugged his son. Now, here's the, I want you to stand here for a second. I never realized this before. The moment the younger son confessed that he has fallen away from God, from his father, the moment he said that, the father, what? Heard. The father didn't even need him to make it to the front door. The moment we confess, God, I need you. God, I need your grace. I have fallen away from you. God hears when we confess. Amen. He doesn't even wait. He didn't even wait it for the younger son to make it to doorsteps. The moment the younger son showed up in the lawn, he ran after him. What an incredible moment. I just I realized we're not home yet. We, all of us, the older brother, the younger brother, all of us are on our way home because of the resurrection. Amen. The resurrection begins the journey of us coming home. God is giving all of us an opportunity to confess to him, God, I am coming home. That begins our journey home. Amen? Let's give him a kind of applause. That was pretty good. I hope that makes sense to you. <laughs> and then if you were in small group, you would ask the question, well, hey, what, what about the, young, the older brother? Why was he having a problem with the younger son coming home? I'm not going to tell you because I want you to sign up for small groups. <laughs> That's good Bible teaching, right? That's good Bible teaching. I'm not going to tell you. Sign up for a small group. The Resurrection Sunday is God calling the lost to come home. We're not home yet, but we have an opportunity right now to begin our journey home. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to run towards us and he'll give us a hug. And he says, I heard you. I heard when you cry out to me when life seems impossible. I heard you confess to me when you feel like you are so far from me. I heard you when you cried out, when you confess, when you beg, or when you praise, when you sing. I heard you when you read my word. I heard the words when you say, God, forgive me. Today begins our journey home. God doesn't care about your, your, your past, your mistakes, your sins. He's seen it all and knows it all. And yet, you are never too far from his grace. Paul described love this way, that, that love is not easily anger. And it keeps no records of wrong. And the scriptures say God is love. So that means God is not angry at you, and he keeps no records of wrong. It doesn't matter how many times you took creation and ran away from him. A man has always been at war with God. Uh, we, we, we claim creation like it's our own, and we keep moving further and further, further, further away from God. And this past Friday and yesterday, Seems like God was defeated. Throughout history, people tend to say that man killed God. But the resurrection changes everything. As the, the band come forward, the, the, the resurrection declares that God is not dead. He won. The Bible it's his word to us. 
It is the authority of our lives, it, the, the world we live in, even though sometimes it seems like evil wins, doesn't it? It seems like evil always outdone the church. But in actuality, when he returns, he will restore his creation to its perfection. Uh, my, my kids subscribe to uh, World Watch News, and it's, t- it's a 10-minute segment of just world news, no politics, no, nothing. They just report the news. And, and whether the news was sad, scary, or disappointing, or frustrating, at the anchor, at the very end of the segment, he always says this, whatever the news, the purpose of the Lord still stands. Amen? The resurrection is God's declaration, victory over sins, and a calling for us to begin our journey home. When you came in, you should have received this. And if you don't have the elements, raise your hands, our ushers will we'll bring that to you at this time. Uh, I, I have a love for fishing. Um, I love to fish. Matter of fact, I, I'll probably go out tomorrow. Uh, if you want to come out with me fishing tomorrow, you're more than welcome to. I'm not sure if my boat will make it back, but we're going. Um, I'm just warning you. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. But, but I have a love for fishing. I got my first fishing kayak um, about 10 years ago. One morning, I took my fishing kayak out with my Shimano bait runner, very expensive rod, and a Shimano cow, uh, cow cutter, another very expensive rod. I got all my tackle box on the kayak, and I got my phone, my car keys, and, and I'm launching at the beach just south of the Boca Inlet. As I'm going out, I haven't made it out of the inlet area yet, just roughly 40 yards and a huge ship came by. For me, it was a ship sitting in my little kayak. It was probably just a little tiny boat, but that's how small my kayak was. And it created these swells. It was my first time ever going out on this fishing kayak. So I'm holding it steady. And one ship after another, I forgot that I live in Boca. Everyone has ships, right? I'm the only one with these tiny things, and everyone else has big ships and yachts and whatnot. So one after another, the swell kept getting bigger and bigger, and, and one after another, I couldn't stop it. And I lean over trying to balance myself, and as I lean over, my kayak flipped. I lost my tackle box. I lost my car keys. I lost my phone. I lost my Shimano bait runner. That was probably the most important thing. And my fishing rod. And I'm reaching for water. Now, consider this. I was only 40 yards offshore, right? But now it seems like I am at 100 feet of water. Now I realize there's only like 8 feet of water. But, but the waves and the swell, it seems scary. And sometimes in life, we seem like we're so far from God. But we're actually not. But that's why you're here. As I'm struggling for water, I'm struggling trying to pick up my things. It was sinking so fast. I lost my keys. I lost my phone. I lost my fishing rods. I lost everything. But you know what I grabbed? My paddle. Because I knew I needed my paddle to make it home. I knew I needed my paddle to make it home. Now, Liz wasn't happy when I called her at the guard booth and said, hey, I lost everything. Can you come pick me up? She's on her way to work, and she has to call in and get a sub and came, up, came back and went and picked me up from the... So she wasn't happy. But have you ever wondered 
What are you holding on to? Why is the cross as a constant reminder in our lives where you are with God? So every Easter that we celebrate, I hope that whether you come into church for the first time or, or just going once in a while or whatnot, I hope you hang on to this. This is your paddle. Because this is a journey to begin your way home. Amen? If you have your communion... Jesus says, this is my body for you. You have in your hands these elements. But he said, this is my body for you. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And after dinner, he took the cup, and he says, this is my blood, the new blood of the covenant. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that through your grace, we are saved that we can't deny, and we can't escape the greatest day in history. That humanity was saved through the cross. And because you live, we begin our journey home. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to begin a moment of worship, just a couple more songs, to celebrate what you just heard and what today is about. In the next few moments, our elders will be up here. If you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today could be your day. They're here to pray for you. We have a baptistry right in the back. And you say, today I want to come home. I want to begin my journey home. I have a change of clothes for you. I have a change of clothes for me. And we have a baptistry right here. But don't leave today without telling God, I'm coming home. As our elders make our way forward, let's begin our worship.
Jesus for our sake you died
peace the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face
May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and the children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you for a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going and your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 He's for you. chapter 6 verse 14 the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace the word of the Lord amen, amen. he has risen God bless you have a wonderful wonderful week